Welcome to the hidden history of Britain. Tonight, Band in the UK takes you back to the early 1990s, revealing the sordid secrets the censor tried to ban. A time when lads and ladettes showed how much they liked to suck and swallow. A time when celebrities didn't even notice if you'd nicked their pint. And they were the first of the Sky generation. They were the first people to have more money than sense. From coked up wingers to soapy mingers, I have a friend who, who maintains that any film that has any lesbian sex in it is not a washout. To a time when the government fed us flame-grilled whoppers. The whole mad cow disease in the beef bowl was like, yep, I'm right, thank you very much, cheers, you're all gonna die in a really horrible, horrible way. Tonight's tasty band menu defines the early 90s. Some beef, some dog, the odd donkey, and some dodgy spanners. The early 90s saw leather, chaps and gimp masks emerge from the dungeon and take to the dance floor. S&M was making a push for the mainstream. But one group of men were spanking their way to court. In December 1990, 16 men were prosecuted for engaging in consensual sadomasochism. The police called the case Operation Spanner, whipping up a national debate on the rights and wrongs of slap and tickle. Now, should it be sufficient for people to be able to plead consent and privacy for the law to allow them to indulge in violent sex with each other? The law laws began hearing the appeals of five men in the so-called Spanner case, and the men were sentenced to prison in December 1990 for their participation in a series of sadomasochistic assaults. The case seemed to touch a nerve with both conservatives and liberals, who lined up against each other to thrash it out on the telly. The idea that you have to make sadomasochism into something wildly trendy and call it SM and turn it into something you demonstrate about is a sign of a deeply sick society, which is even bringing our law and our justice system into mockery. What I'm concerned about is the imposition of those views on, on other people with criminal sanctions, about sending people to prison because they disagree with your view. That's the real problem, and that's what you're saying. The Spanner trials all started off when a load of middle-aged gay men used to meet together in one of their homes and they used to do all kinds of SM, sadomasochistic stuff, with each other. And it didn't really concern anybody else, no neighbours could see in or anything like that. But one day a tape they'd made of it for fun was found by somebody. The case came to light in 1987 when a number of videos were seized in Bolton. It transpired that nobody had been seriously harmed, the videos were not for sale and there were no unwilling victims. But the obscene publication squad was so shocked by the material that they set up in Operation Spanner, the largest ever operation of its kind. I remember being shocked by reading what happened. I remember there was some guy who had another guy nailed his, his penis and testicles to a chopping board, and I'm crossing my legs here at the minute, you know, the, you winced at that. But I also thought, this is weird. First of all, how old is this guy? He's, a, he's an adult. You know, these are consenting adults, as they say. And... Why were the police spending my tax money, well, not my tax money then, but my dad's tax money, but it would be my tax money now, to investigate people having sex with each other? Okay, it may be unusual sex. I may not like it. I may not want to participate. But it wasn't like they were doing it, you know, by the roadside as a little tableau to encourage kids to join in. They were doing it in the privacy of their own homes or hotels or whatever. And I kind of thought, leave them alone. I accept that what we were involved with is, is very much a minority activity. But I would contend that it should be part of a mature democracy to protect the rights of minorities, provided those minorities don't actually do any harm to citizens and the public generally. And I contend that we did none of that harm. Some of the allegations made you squirm, but tabloid newspaper reporting made things seem a lot worse than they really were. The perfect example was that uh, one guy had an eyelet in his foreskin and uh, on this video of what they were doing uh, that had been drawn out and a nail had been put through that eyelet so he wasn't breaking any skin that was there was already a, a hole there um, and nailed it now it looks oh a man's foreskin is being nailed to a board but that isn't really what was happening it sounds pretty scary 
until you know what actually was happening. Many argued that the Spanner case was an attempt to bring everyone back to the missionary position and reeked of hypocrisy, as subsequent cases involving heterosexual S&M were not prosecuted. I can't say that we should be allowed to have whatever opinion we want, we should be allowed to take drugs if we want, and then say, but actually, but you can't have the kind of sex you want because I'm not interested in it or I dislike it, doesn't mean to say I think we should be banning it or, or legislating against it. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. If people want to do that, that's their choice, and that should be the end of it. The Spanner men were convicted, and three of them were sent to prison, leaving the others free to indulge their S&M fantasies, which would be considerably safer than tucking into a beef burger. In 1990, number 10 got a new tenant. Margaret Thatcher bid us a tearful farewell, and she was replaced by Clark Kent. I don't promise you that it will be easy, and I don't promise you that it will be quick, but I believe it is an immensely worthwhile job to do, because it will be neither easy nor quick. If you will forgive me, I will go into number 10 straight away and make a start right now. John Major settled down to life in number 10, and started doing to the country what he'd been doing to Edwina Curry. But little did he realize what was being served up for Sunday lunch. Another farmer whose cattle were infected with the cattle disease BSE has died from the human condition linked by some experts to the disease. The 54-year-old man is the third farmer to die from Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease. In May 1990, the British government banned home-produced beef from British schools and hospitals. But this was a staggering three years after government pathologists had first confirmed BSE in cows. Beef farming in Britain was ruined, and fatal cases emerged of the disease moving from cows to humans. I'm a vegetarian. I've been vegetarian since I was about 15. I did it partly to impress a girl, and two years later it worked. But, um, and also because I don't agree with the census sort of killing animals and all that. But I don't, you know, I don't go on about it. And if people eat meat, that's cool. And I, you know, it doesn't offend me in the slightest. But the whole mad cow disease and the beef ban was like, yep, I'm right. Thank you very much. Cheers. You're all going to die in a really horrible, horrible way. It was kind of a vindication of my mum saying, are you sure you don't want a bacon sandwich? I found the whole BSC story really irritating because every other day a journalist would find a scientist who was prepared to say there could be a million of us who are all going to die of variant CJD. We have no idea. This is an epidemic, um, and we have no idea how many of us are infected, how many of us are going to be infected, you know, what it was that infected us, and this was causing panic all over the place. The rapid spread of the disease was eventually attributed to animal feed. Contaminated cattle had been minced and fed back to other cows. By 1992, BSE had spread to three cows in every thousand. A cow is, is what, some uh, half a ton or more in weight. So you start to put that into meat and bone meal, and then you start spreading that through lots of feed. You wouldn't have actually needed many original cattle to spread that a very long way. By July 1993, the total number of BSE cases in Britain hit 100,000. But the government seemed to be taking a high-handed approach to the problem. Your critics say that meat inspectors simply aren't as qualified as vets to spot BSE suspect cattle at abattoirs. Well, maybe they aren't. I wouldn't expect them to be as qualified as vets. Vets, after all, do a five-year training course. I wouldn't expect them to be able to spot them. So what? Well, they're missing a good many BSE suspect cattle, is the suggestion. Well, so what? After this public relations triumph, the government came up with a foolproof plan to allay our fears. Agriculture Minister John Selwyn Gummer was dispatched to a field with a burger and his three-year-old daughter. Then beef, then beef, beef is safe. Look, watch, I'll give a beef burger to my young daughter or something. And that horrible just film of this girl, have I got to eat this? All right, then. And just thinking, right, firstly, we don't, at the time, we didn't know what the connection was, if it was going to affect people. Secondly, don't bring your kids into it. Something don't do with your kids. Your kid is going to do what you say because you're her or his dad. You know, that's, they're going to do what you say. But like Selwyn Gummer's daughter, the rest of Europe didn't want to be force-fed quarter pounders. And in 1996, the EU announced a complete ban on the export of all British beef. 
We are quite certain on the scientific and health advice that we are given that British beef is safe. Safe for the British and safe for others. You get all these silly, crappy butchers, you know, these right-wing butchers in, you know, upper dog's ass or wherever, going, yeah, we're still selling British beef. A ban was about to emerge on mauling mutts that would inflame a nation of dog lovers. Dog fighting has long been an underground sport in the UK. But in 1991, after a spate of dog attacks on children, the government banned the import of fighting dogs. The savage attack on six-year-old Roxana Khan last weekend stunned a nation of self-confessed animal lovers. Roxana was set upon by a pit bull near her home in Bradford on Saturday night. Rescuers were also injured trying to free the little girl. They used bricks and stones, but the dog only let go when its head was shut in a car door. Mainly, it was just fat f***y blokes from the council estate with loads of tats and a big gold chain and their pit bull, you know, and they were doing it because they had a tiny cock, really. That's, that's what it's about, is they've, they've, they've got a, a tiny penis and um, they're a little bit racist and... Um, if you can have degrees of racism, and they got a pit bull because it's British. It was absolutely essential to ban fighting dogs because the people who were owning these dogs were not, you know, Barbara Woodhouse, you know. <laughs> they weren't owning them for the interest of their peculiarities, that, you know, that was, that, that was to do with their breed. They were just there as weapons. Um, and it took the government quite a long time to realise that. I thought they were rather slow, actually, when they, to realise that actually it was just like walking around with a gun, with a gun on a lead. Um, so you're not allowed to own a gun, so why should you be allowed to own a rock or a pit bull terror that's been trained to tear people's throats out. Roxana received 25 bites, a lacerated lung and four broken ribs. Surgeons had to rebuild her chest wall and believe that she could be scarred for life. One story came out in the papers and suddenly, uh, you know, bulldogs and terriers and uh, stations, they, they were all being classed as dangerous, deadly dogs. And we've got... The pit bulls was the one, wasn't it? Pit bulls were, were the ones that were, were going to rip your face off. Um, and so th th this bad a sport that I don't think was that widespread. I might be. A bit I didn't think that was James Furman's call. But Furman's moral boundary was about to be tested by a young director called Ray Brady, whose film Boy Meets Girl directly challenged his views of censorship. Though seemingly an S&M film, Brady showed in graphic detail the consequences of on-screen violence. The brief synopsis of the film was the fact that uh, a woman picks up a man in a bar uh, he thinks it's a chance meeting. They go back to her place, he thinks for casual sex. Um, he has a drink and then he's drugged and he wakes up in, strapped in a, in a dentist chair in her basement. And we spend the majority of the film then uh, showing her as a serial killer, psychologically and physically destroying him. I think it's time to defile the sacred hole. Calvin, <laughs> why, Kevin? Yeah. Ah. Boy Meets Girl starts off uh, in standard exploitation, sex exploitation style, and then suddenly shifts gear to become more of a kind of feminist statement against male violence and and male behaviour. But then towards the end of the film, you realise that it's not that either, and that the main character is just genuinely a serial killer who is really using all the feminist arguments as an excuse for what she does to the male character and at the end of the film she actually is looking for a female victim. You probably guess by now that you're not the first visitor to my basement. It's visiting day is it? 
Yeah, I've seen your other visitors. Oh, but you haven't. Met them face to face, I mean. Call me old fashioned. But I think that people should be properly introduced. The film was banned for about eight years. Um, it was originally banned after we were invited in to talk to James Furman and he realised that we would not re-edit the film or shoot extra footage or scenes to basically revise the film to, an, uh, to something which he would accept. Um, it wasn't the fact that we were uncompromising and the fact that it, it's just the fact that we completely disagreed with what he wanted us to do, that we wanted to say something uh, within the film uh, and we wanted to, to ask questions and to address certain problems which we felt that he was telling us to turn a blind eye to and so we refused uh, and therefore he banned the film. You should count yourself lucky. I've just condensed what could have been a long and weary and pointless life. Boy Meets Girl was finally released in 2002 after an eight-year ban. It's not really an s and movie. Uh, what it is, is, and I have to say this, a frankly extremely amateurish horror movie, or would-be horror movie. And at the level of creating free songs of horror, it really doesn't work very well. If you deferred to the censor, it seemed films would finally get released. In 1992, Caged Women was banned, but eventually granted an 18 certificate after 24 minutes were cut. Initially it was banned outright by the BBFC, then the distributors took it away, cut something like 20 minutes out of it, sent it back to the BBFC, who then took another three minutes out of it and allowed it to be released. Obviously the version that's on sale in the UK is fairly tame. It didn't really appeal to my personal tastes, but I thought, I was looking at it and I think, I have a lot of male friends who would really get off on this movie. You know, I have a friend who, who maintains that um, uh, any film that has any lesbian sex in it is not a washout. Well, there's always the argument in those films that they are exploiting women, degrading women. Of course, that's exactly what they're, what they're doing. I mean, they are exploitation films. They have no real meaning. They're just there to provide people with 90 minutes of sex and violence. Now, the problem with that is, do you say then that because these films are actually degrading and and humiliating and exploitative, they're dangerous. And that's the only reason why you should be banning films, because they're actually dangerous to society. If James Furman had been head of the FA, he would probably have banned most footballers for their imitable activities. Indeed, for one club, the antics of some team members were definitely triple X rated. Football, like sex, used to be a twice-weekly ritual, but when Sky Sports arrived, it was on the box more times than Big Brother. The excess of football was reflected on and off the screen, as working-class lads became national heroes and had way more money than Sen. Excess was a story about a captain, a manager, and a star striker, who gave one club a bad, bad name. Here, but like most celebrities, their success would bring with it all the trappings. Drink, drugs, the priory, and bands all round. Who gave... well, the Arsenal team of that period weren't so much a football outfit as a stag do in shorts. They were the first of the Sky generation. They were the first people to have more money than sense. I think you've always had a working class binge drinking culture in, in Britain. What the difference was with, with the footballers at the end of the, eight, uh, end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, was you suddenly having guys from working class backgrounds getting the sort of money per week that their dad would make in a year and having nothing to do but spend it on drink and drugs and fast living, basically. And, that, and so the, the, the background was that culture and they just took it to the next extreme. You had a situation with someone like Tony Adams, who was uh, joined Arsenal at 18, was a captain at 21. Spent the early part of the 90s so pissed that he can't, in his own autobiography, he says he can't remember years of his life. Tony Adams was a boy wonder who joined Arsenal at the age of 18. By 21, he was the club's youngest ever captain. 
But the pressure of top-level football, coupled with an addictive personality, was his downfall. In December 1990, after a two-day drinking binge, Adams attempted to drive home and crashed his car. The result? Four months in jail, a fine and a two-year driving ban. Despite character references from men like Pat Jennings, the judge jailed Adams for Christmas. Arsenal manager George Graham described Adams as a colossus of the club and hinted at an appeal. Everybody could see there the friends he had in court so he was speaking on his behalf. Uh, but I think appeal and appeal. What he do you think? To his lawyers about Tony Adams crashed his car. He was four times over the limit. He'd been driving at 135 miles an hour. He went across a dual carriageway, crashed into a house, and people came out and asked, offered him a drink, meaning tea or coffee. And he thought he meant another brandy. It has been claimed that the authorities were tough on him because of who he was. But I, I'm not so sure. I, the guy was just an idiot and needed locking away for our own safety. I think if the authorities wanted to get tough on footballers in those days, they should have halved their salary and given them a curfew and not let them out at night because they were a danger to everybody. In December 1996, Adams reached rock bottom. After a five-week bender, he admitted to the press that he was an alcoholic. Cheers, mate. It's not just happened overnight. I'd like to make that point clear. Um, how hard was it telling the other lads, sir? Uh, to... That was a very big obstacle for me. Um, I'm not living a lie anymore, which is great. Feel a lot better for it. You're unbelievable. But Adams wasn't the only Arsenal player with an addictive personality. Paul Merson topped him in spades. A genius on pitch. Off it, he was a drug-addled gambling booze monster. Rather like Tony Adams, Paul Merson grew up in the drinking culture in English football. There was an adage which Adam and Merson had. It was actually Terry Butcher's adage, who was England captain at the time, win or lose, we will booze. After every game that they won, Merson would signal to the fans, let's all go and get drunk. Now, that meant three pints down the old bull and butcher to the people in the crowd. To him, it meant champagne, half a kilo of cocaine. And they had no responsibilities at that time. Merson... His game was going, there was no doubt about it. I mean, I can remember watching Arsenal at that time and, and watching him run up and down the wing and think, this guy's knackered. And, you know, and the game was 15 minutes old and he was puffing and, um, and just not getting up and down. Um, so again, in a sense, he had no choice but, uh, but to do this. I mean, he was getting left out of the side. Um, the manager was on his case. Um, and he was in so much pain himself. <laughs> In November 1994, Merson broke down at a press conference and confessed to his cocaine, gambling and alcohol addictions. And in an attempt to face up to his problems, sold his drug fueled story to the press. I've got to go to Alcoholics Anonymous and Gamblers Anonymous and that, that's where my life is now. You know, it's no more in pubs, that's, that's where my life is. I can't understand how he would have got through the drugs testing. I, I can't understand how he could have been taking cocaine on so many different occasions that he's talked about and not once was caught by the drug testing procedure. I, 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 can't, I can't explain it. But it wasn't just the players who were attracting bans. Team manager George Graham was up to his own high jinks. In the same month Merson blubbed at a press conference, Graham came a cropper when the Mail on Sunday revealed the manager was taking kickbacks. George Graham's, Graham was a fearsome man. Um, even Tony Adams found him fearsome. Not physically intimidating, but because he had complete control, complete authority. Um, his record at Arsenal of winning trophies gave him that authority. Um, and players didn't argue with him. Players had to accept uh, what he said. And um, he was pretty much all in control at that time. It was claimed that Graham had received money from Norwegian football agent Rune Hauger for helping the agent sell players in the Premier League. Graham said the money was given as a thank you and was in no way a bung. Arsenal FC and the Inland Revenue begged to differ. George Graham was, was trusted implicitly by the Arsenal board simply because of the success that he brought Arsenal. The amount of leeway that he had over transfers, he was allowed to deal with agents very much by himself, with Ken Fryer, the, uh, one of the Arsenal management in tow, but he was allowed predominantly to deal with uh, the transfers himself. Now, the thought of a premiership manager being able, or given that sort of leeway these days, is, is, is completely, completely unbelievable. Uh, and again, it's a case of different, it's a different age, a different era. George Graham was not making a vast sum of money as manager. Um, 
And uh, it may have been a factor, a slight resentment he felt that he was at that time a very, very successful manager, accumulating trophies for the club and not getting the recognition he deserved, certainly financially, from, from the Arsenal board. Um, and there he was, bringing young players through that hadn't cost, cost the, play, the, the club vast sums of money, um, and doing all this uh, on what, what he might consider, certainly in Premier League terms these days, a shoestring. Um, a brown envelope arrived from a Norwegian agent called Rune Hauger um, over a meeting in a London hotel. He deemed it an unsolicited gift uh, to the rest of us. That's a bung. And um, in the, it was a way of Hauger saying, thank you for getting me into the English market. Thank you for buying two of my players. In the end, Graham's backhander totaled over £400,000. Although he'd given the dosh back to Arsenal, it was enough for the FA to find him guilty of professional misconduct. I am bitterly disappointed with the verdict. I always said the payments were unsolicited, and this has been proved. The Commission decided that the receipt of the payments constituted misconduct, and that is all I'm saying tonight. In February 1995, Graham was unceremoniously sacked from the club and banned from football for a year. Arsenal went into free fall until the arrival of Arsene Wenger in 1997, who took the club back to the top of the table. 80% of people in football know about or have taken backhanders. Brian Clough and his bags of money at motorway service stations. You speak to any footballer, they'll talk about finding a bunch of fivers in football boots in dressing rooms before games. It's common practice. Agents want a bung for this. Rival managers want a bung for that. And the laughable thing is that the authorities got all high and mighty about George Graham when that could be happening every week if football decided to wash its dirty laundry in public. Coming up, Hitler, Buggery and Margaret Thatcher. Blimey, comics have changed since my day. By the early 1990s, the innocent pleasures of comics were lost with the arrival of Savoy Books, Lord Horror and Men and Ecker. Scandalous graphic novels which were determined to offend. I think to understand Lord Horror you need to understand the Savoy story. Their shop was raided 60 times by Manchester police over a few years. At one point they were being raided every couple of weeks. And I think they just became very, very angry and wanted to do something that would just upset everybody. If the sexism, racism and tawdry illustrations had shocked, then the images of Margaret Thatcher being buggered or Lord Horror shooting up with Adolf Hitler were bound to offend. It starts off as a, as a vague political satire, you know, with, with pictures of, of, of Maggie Thatcher getting bummed, you know, and getting sliced in half. That's brilliant. And then it ends with that. And you've got to think, on, on no level is there any way, you know, and these, these are images that actually happened and it's important that we see them, I guess. We shouldn't see them in the comic. The publishers, Savoy Books, believed that their Lord Horror comics and follow-on novel, far from being childish entertainment, were on a par with books such as Ulysses and Naked Lunch. The kind of audience that those magazines are aiming at are teenage a teenage audience, you know, dark parka wearing boys with pimples who sit around in the room all day with gun catalogues. Now, the majority of them will grow out of it um, because that's just what boys do. Um, feeding them this kind of stuff is so supremely dangerous. It's so disgusting. It's just full of hate. It's just full of empty. Uh, I can't stand it. Savoy Books were prosecuted under the Obscene Publications Act, which claimed the comics were pornographic. Champions of free speech supported the publisher, perhaps just on a matter of principle. You can very easily select individual frames from the Meganeka comics or from the Lord Horror novel or from Motherfuckers and make it seem absolutely atrocious and appalling. But when you see the whole thing in context, and again, I would stress that the context is one of 
complete stylization and absolute kind of phantasmagoria, um, then I don't think that those things taken in context could possibly remotely be seen to be the views of, of, of the authors. Savoy was found guilty and Lord Horror banned. But after an appeal in 1992, the verdict was overturned. The court accepted that uh, this was not glorifying racism, this was an attempt, and <laughs> in my view, not a very successful attempt, but invariably, you don't ask uh, the, whether the, the book has been a success or a failure. It was uh, a genuine attempt to, to write uh, a piece of literature, and it deserved, for that reason, to, uh, not to be convicted. You see, sometimes banning something is good. I, the the, the anti-Semitism, the disgusting, nauseating depravity of those pieces of work um, is astounding. You've got to have right-wing people put their views out so that you can, you're aware that these people exist and that you can say, well, no, that's obviously wrong, that's obviously a bad thing. But that's just so far, so far down the wrong road, I think, that... Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's distasteful to the point of just gross insensitivity and offensiveness. Tomorrow night, Band examines the difficulties of parenting. It's the worst of sucking dick. Oh, oh, yeah! No, but have you ever swallowed it before, though? No. It seemed to me the whole purpose of that film was to glamorise bad behaviour. And that's what they did, that's what they achieved. Looks at the world's worst drivers. It's a film in which the characters have no relationship to the real world about you. They are defined simply in terms of their sexual perversions. And why Brit art was really shit art. When you make a picture of the Virgin Mary and you incorporate cow dung into it, you're saying to everyone who's got that religious faith that this is what I think of your religion. Well, that final part is tomorrow night at 11.35. Now, to vote for the best banned movie of all time, go to channel4.com slash banned. Next tonight, our late movie features an intense performance by Harvey Keitel, which caused censors to get very jittery. Bad Lieutenant.